Good morning, church. I know while the the lights were down that uh, some of you were looking for a spot, there are spots up this way. Um, I always tell folks, you can almost always get a seat on the front row at church. The only other place I know that's that's true is at the movie theater, where you seem to always be able to get a seat in the front row. Um, Where'd he go? Mr. Welty. Let me see what you have there. This one's a little bigger and a different one, but short. But uh, a text that I think will be a little more to the point of what we're trying to do. But I, I have faith in your ability. You want to introduce yourself? Can we have a mic, please? Do you introduce yourself to the folks? Um, I'm Trevor Welty. Thank you. When he finally came to his senses, he said to himself, at home, even in the hired servants had food enough to spare. And here I am dying of hunger. 18, I will go home to my father and say, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you. 19, and I am no longer worthy of being called your son. Please take me on as a hired servant. 20, so he returned home to his father. And while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming. Filled with love and compassion, he ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. Luke 15, 17 to 20. Thank you, sir. I, I don't know uh, how you feel about those things, but um, thank you. I'm really enjoying hearing from the youngest parts of our family uh, in reading the scriptures before we, uh, we start the, the sermon this morning and each morning in the last few weeks. Um, it is a tradition I intend to keep, keep up. So I want to speak to those of you young readers out there. Um, if you would be willing to help me out with this, in your bulletin is an email address where you can reach me. Email me. Most of you already know how to do that. Um, if you don't, have your parents do it. But um, I would love to just have as many of you as I possibly can take part in the worship service and read. And... Um, I, I do want to limit this to like 12 and under, okay? So if you're 87, um, read for Sabbath school class uh, or uh, volunteer to preach. We'll see, how, we'll see what we can do about that. But um, I would love to have uh, more of you. I uh, have been just tapping on the shoulders of, of someone when they're getting here on Sabbath morning, which I don't mind doing. I just don't like the terrified look that they get when I ask them. Trevor wasn't too frightened. He just he did look at me a little quizzically, though. As we begin this morning, um, I'll tell you a story I heard a long time ago. Um, you know, preachers, we collect other preachers' stories. And I, can't, I was trying to remember where I heard this the first time, what preacher it was, but um, some preacher, some point, somewhere, I heard tell this story. So that covers whomever it was. The story is pretty simple. It's, I don't, it wasn't his own story. He, uh, he was telling the story of a, a father and son. And the situation with the father and the son had gotten to be a problem. The son was beginning to rebel, and he was getting to an age where that rebellion meant he could split any time he wanted. And so when he got into those, those years and just finally had had enough of his dad and enough of being at home and enough and enough and enough and enough, he got up one day and just left, packed a few things, emptied his little uh, savings account, and split. And he made a point, this, this kid who tells the story later, of just going and doing everything his father had tried to teach him not to do. He just went out there and did every foolish thing that he could imagine. Um, he, was, uh, he was committed to living a life opposite of what his father had been teaching him. And so the father had kind of been following a little bit. You know, kids typically, they, they, they start with familiar places. So the father was kind of keeping track. He was right there in the same community. And people were telling him, well, I saw your son at such and such, and I saw your son at such and such. And, I saw and the places where his son was frequenting um, were certainly the father's worst nightmares. Uh, the local bars and things were his regular habitat. And... Uh, This went on, and after a few weeks, a few months, um, he lost track of him. 
And so when he lost track of him, the father started saying, I, 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 I need to figure out something to do. And so he started thinking about what he might be able to do to, to touch his son. So he had a picture of himself taken, the father. And he wrote on the bottom of each picture, son, please come home. And then he went to every haunt he thought he might be able to find his son in. He went to every bar, brothel, and other place that he thought his son might go, and he took one of those pictures and he pasted it up. He pasted them in the bathrooms. If they had a bulletin board, he put them there. He just got these pictures to every place he could find. Four years pass. Imagine what that would be like. Four years pass. And finally, his son walked into a bar one night, and there on the wall in the bar was a picture of his father. He saw the picture, and he saw the note, and just said, please come home. And so he decided that the life he'd been leading wasn't all he, it was cracked up to be. And he decided to go home. And so he headed home, in the middle of that very night, by the time he got home, got home that night, it was 3 a.m. He looks at the front of the house, and there's a light on it, a lamp inside the front door on. And he walked up to the door thinking, how am I going to get in? I've long since lost my key to this house. And he tried the door, and it was open. So he went in the house, and the disturbance of his coming woke his father, and his father got up. His father came to find him in the living room, 3 o'clock in the morning, wiping the sleep from his eyes, smiling as wide as the room. He embraced him. He said, thank you. Welcome home. I'm glad you're home. And his son immediately went to the practical. He said, Dad, it's 3 o'clock in the morning. Why are the lights on and why is the front door open? And his dad said, I lost track of you almost four years ago. And ever since, I was worried that you might not have your key. So I left the door open and the light on in case you came home. The scriptures have a picture of God who has the light on and the door open, waiting for his children to come home. As we, um, as we at this church have over the years looked for a way to describe what it means to be the, this congregation, the story of the prodigal son and the collision moment between the father and the son have become our favorite image. In this church, this church is called Grace Point. And grace is first for a reason. If you were to go and look at our website, you would find it is called, gra the, 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 the moniker on our website is grace is the point. Without grace, there's nothing else, really. Without grace, we are of no hope. We're lost. We have no opportunity if there is no grace. And so we often will return to the realization that we all need the covering of God's grace. Can you imagine what it was like to walk into that living room, that front room of that house that night and have his, son get up, his father get up and greet him, wrap his arms around him, smile? After all he'd done to try to throw off his father's leadership, to be welcomed home like that. That's the picture. That's what God is doing for you and I. He's forgiven or willing to forgive what is out there, what has been, and accept us all back home. If you're starting the new year in church, if this was, if this was one, of your, uh, one of your resolutions this year, I'm going to go back to church. Welcome back. Welcome home. Thanks for being here. Let this become a place where you feel comfortable and familiar. 
God's grace is available no matter where we wander. In Ephesians chapter 2, Paul, describing the Ephesians, says, once you were dead because of your disobedience and many sins. You know, I, I've always been uh, amused a little bit by certain things in the scripture. And Paul really doesn't pull many punches when he talks about these people in their past life. When he gets into the lists, he starts listing their prior sins. It's a little bit of an embarrassment. But he's pretty straight. He's pretty frank with them. Because the magnitude of their sin magnifies the grace of God. It's amazing how the two work together. It's the, the magnitude of where they've been magnifies where God has brought them. And so he says, once you were dead because of your diso disobedience and your many sins, you had chosen this lifestyle, you had gone after this thing, and you were gone, you were lost, you were dead. And then he continues, verses 4 and 5, but God's so rich in mercy. He loved you so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life. He gave us life in the resurrection of Christ. He gave us life in the death of Christ. He gave us life in the covering of the blood of Christ. He gave us life. And then he explains how. This is, uh, for those of you who have been around a long time at Grace Point, this is... Uh, where the chair often comes out. And as you know, this is one of my favorite passages in the Bible. This is a New Living Translation, just so you can see it and hear it a little differently. God saved you by His grace when you believed. The text that you may be more familiar with is you are saved by grace through faith. God saved you by His grace when you believed. Get all of that. Note that it doesn't say when you finally figured it out. God saved you by his grace when you finally stopped being such a dummy and figured it out. No, he knows you're a dummy. He knows I'm a dummy. He knows it's a little tiny brain and a great big God. He knows that we're never going to fully understand. And yet, when we believe, when we chose to follow, when we accepted him as our savior, when by faith we said yes to God, then... God spread his covering over us and gave us his grace. You're saved by grace through faith. You, God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Ever gotten a gift that you tried to take credit for getting? Can't really do it, can you? Because the minute you get credit for getting it, it ceases to be a gift. Ever gotten a gift you tried to pay for? I once was given a very extravagant gift. Uh, it was a gift of a trip, and I was going with a person. And the person's one, one comment to me before we left on this trip was, I am paying for things, and I don't want you to argue with me about paying. Now, that's a, that's a pretty spectacular thing in it, and, and uh, I was actually happy to say thank you. It was, it was beyond my, the reach of my wallet. But had I argued with him about paying, it would have lessened the gift. So many of us, when we come to God, we try to pay him back. We say, oh yeah, well, God, God saved me by his grace. Now I just have to clean up my act. Well, yeah, he'd like your act to get cleaned up, but it isn't what causes the covering of his grace. The cleaning up of your act, the, the better life that he hopes for you is because it's a better life, that you might have life and have it more abundantly, which is maybe next week. But the fact of the matter is that it is a gift, and a gift, in order to be a gift, has to be free to you, the receiver. Hold on to that idea. Don't let that go. Because it is so easy to slip into the, 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 slip into the modality. It's much easier to do than to say. To slip into the modality of trying to earn it. Trying to be good enough for it. Trying to find some way to pay God back for it. 
This is not a payment plan where you get better and God keeps you. This is simply you accepting God's grace and him giving it to you. It is a gift. It is a what? A gift. Please try to hang on to that. Would you turn to your neighbor and tell him this is a gift? Go ahead, even those of you who are shy. Someone tell Adrian. He's sat on the edge, Adrian. (laughs) It's a gift. And as a gift, it must be free in order to be a gift. This text will go on and talk about the the resetting of your life in, in, in in verse 10. It is 100% free. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done, so none of us can boast about it. Nobody gets to walk through the pearly gates patting themselves on the back. Nobody gets to sit sit down next to you at that great banquet table of God and say, I got here on my own. I don't know how you got here. You look like you got here by somebody letting you in, but I earned it. Nobody gets that. Because nobody can possibly earn it. So I want to just go back to this, you are saved by grace through faith. I want to talk about the belief and the faith side of it. To me, the best word for this is trust. I keep moving this thing over so that more of you on that side can see it behind this. I'm sorry. The best word for belief or faith to me to explain it the most clearly, is the word trust. When I was 16 years old, a friend of mine, I was at camp meeting, and um, he had a, a nice car. I had a freshly minted license and had already had an accident. Yep, the night I got my license. Pretty bad one, actually. Reaches in his pocket, pulls out the keys to his car, tosses them to me, and says, hey, can you take my car and go blah, 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 whatever the errand was. Park it here when you get back. And I'm looking at those keys and realizing how much faith there was in those keys. He said, I trust you. Take my car, do whatever Bring it back safely. That's what this is saying. When you you choose to actually trust God, to trust him as your covering, to trust in his grace, to trust in his sacrifice, to trust in the resurrection, when you choose to trust him that he actually wants to take you home, not leave you stuck on this muddy little planet of ours, when you choose to trust him, He says, good, great, covered, let's go. Ticket punched, let's go. I'll walk you all the way home from here. Now, we get this confused because of the word belief. The word faith has all kinds of theological implications, and we look at it, and we're kind of like, okay, faith. Yeah, yeah, great. I have faith in McDonald's that my French fries will be done correctly. I believe in a lot of things I don't trust. I believe that the weatherman knows something about the weather, but every time he proves that I can't really trust him. I mean, it was a half hour early today. Rain wasn't supposed to start for five more minutes. And some of you came in with proof. There are lots of things I believe, and I, I believe this chair that I randomly picked up over there will hold me. Raise your hand if you think it'll hold me. You should say that because you're sitting on similar looking chairs. Some of you look lighter than me. Some of you look like you might be a little heavier than me. I'm kind of 200 pounds of person. And the chair looks pretty stout. It looks like all those you guys have. In fact, let me give it a quick look. Screws are still in the bottom. Welds look okay. I believe the chair will hold me. How's it working for me, as Dr. Phil would say? Is the chair working? Not at all. Is the chair available? Yes. Do I believe the chair will hold me? Well, of course I do. That's why I use the word trust. 
Because trust happens somewhere between here and here. This is how most Christians try to lead their life. I want to look like I'm sitting. I want to look like I'm trusting. I want to look like I believe. I want everybody who looks at me to say, that's a believer in Jesus right there. And all they get is really sore and uncomfortable. That's why they get such grumpy looking faces. You do this for 10 minutes. I'll bet you have a grumpy face. But this, that's faith. That is the act of trusting God. And when you say, okay, I'm stopping. I quit trusting me. I quit trusting my information, my knowledge, my pastor. I'm going to trust Jesus. This is what it looks like. I'm going to stop trying to do this on my own. I'm going to stop trying to do it with my, my intellect, with the gathering of all the information that I have. You're not saved by knowledge. You're not saved by information. You are not saved by knowing exactly when Jesus will come. You're not saved by vegetarianism. Thank you, Jesus. You know why? Because Jesus wasn't a vegetarian. I hope that's not a revelation to you. If it is, I'm sorry. Talk to me later. I'll explain it. Are all those things better? Oh, yeah. All those things are great. But it is your faith in the authority and power and sacrifice and resurrection of Jesus that saves you. You are saved by grace through faith. Unless you think that, that there's a difference between the Holy Spirit, Jesus, and God, the Bible says they are one. So the same faith you have in Jesus, you can have in the Father, you can have in the Holy Spirit. They are one. So here's the deal. This is what we mean by grace point. It's the collision. Oh, it's not up there. It's the collision between my need and God's grace. My life on fire, crashes into God's grace, and he puts out the fire. It's the moment when my need hits his grace, and it goes on and on and on. And those of you who have been Christians for a while know, you need grace on a regular basis, right? Every morning. Paul said, I die daily. He's talking about letting go of the reins of his own life. He's talking about letting God drive, letting God be in charge, giving God the faith that he, that he deserves, trusting that he actually knows what he's doing better than I. That's easier for some of us and harder for some of us. It's easier in some cir circumstances and harder in some circumstances. But a grace point, that's what we're trying to say in this name. A grace point is that, that place where those two things collide. Where God's grace meets my needs. When God's grace meets your needs, that's that point. That's that collision point. And that's why this prodigal son story is such a big picture for us. Such an important place for us to stand in Scripture and understand. Because the story has this very thing going on. It starts with the audience. The story starts with the audience because it's important to know who the audience is. It's the, the audience is being told the story because they don't understand this point. Tax collectors and sinners have gathered with Jesus. I love the way the New Living Translation says it. Tax collectors and other notorious sinners... These people are apparently in the post office. There are pictures up there. Other notorious sinners often came to listen to Jesus teach. It's a regular gathering of a, a bunch of miscreants to come and hear Jesus. Tax collectors and notorious sinners often came to hear Jesus teach. This made the Pharisees and the teachers of the religious laws complain that he was associating with such sinful people and even eating with them. Yeah, say it that way, because it's an ant even. It's an ant even. It's like bigger. Can you believe he even eats? He has potluck with these folks, and who knows what their kitchen looks like? Potlucks are covered by his grace. The Pharisees are upset because of the people who are listening to Jesus, and so the Bible says. Jesus told them this story. Now, he actually tells them three. We're going to skip the first two. He tells them the story of the lost sheep, the lost coin. We're going to the last story, the story of the prodigal father. Yeah, I, I said that correctly. 
To illustrate the point further, Jesus told them this story. A man had two sons. Remember what we say about these sons? It's great to have two sons in the first century. You have an heir and a, does anybody remember? A spare. You have an heir and a spare heir. So it's great to have two sons in the first century. The younger son told his father, I want my share of your estate now before you die. Again, I'm better off if you're dead. So his father agreed. You're supposed to go, what? What? He agreed to this? That's crazy talk. What kind of person does that? That's the point of the story. This father, the father's crazy. The father's doing outrageous things, outlandish things. Look at him. He just agreed to give his youngest son his inheritance before he died. And so he divided his wealth between them both. So where does that leave the father? Destitute and dependent on his sons. Crazy, crazy talk. Do you guys get that it's crazy on this side? Because they're not getting it on that side so much. It's crazy talk. It's crazy talk. Who would agree to such a thing? The Pharisees and the watchers are going, that's a crazy idea. Who would do such a thing? Now imagine if that were your kid. If your 18-year-old and your 21-year-old came up to you and they said, hey, Dad, um, I'd like you to cash in everything and give me the money now before you die. It'll be a lot more fun if I get it while I'm young. Would you do it? No, because that's crazy talk. No one would do such a thing. But this guy did. The whole premise of the story should set you on your ear. Why would he do such a thing? That's a crazy idea to do. And as would be expected, this immature young man goes and does what we would expect an immature young person to do. He blows it on riotous living. We don't know what that means. His brother has an imagination about it, and we've thrown his brother imagina brother's imagination on him. We don't know what he did with it. We don't know what the riotous living was. I think he bought a bitly. If I suddenly had un unlimited wealth, I might buy a Bentley. I don't know. It'd be interesting. I'd at least go look at one. To walk in there with a big enough wad in my pocket to buy one would just be fun all by itself. Especially if I could peel off hundreds while I was talking to the guy. Just keep counting. I'm just trying to figure out how much I have with me today. Hundred what? Let me get in that other pocket. Wouldn't that be fun? I think, you know, he just blew it. He just spent it on stuff. He went to the best, best meals he could find. He slept in the best hotels he could find. He bought a brand new pinstripe flamed camel. You try to find one of those. Those things are rare as hound's teeth. Hen's teeth. Hound's teeth are actually pretty common. End of the day, he's broke. And wouldn't you know it, right when he loses that last buck, right when they repossess the Bentley, right at that moment, a famine strikes the land. Famines are pretty common at this time in history because everybody's farm is dependent on the weather. And if you're not getting enough rain in your particular region, then famine. And so now he doesn't have money and he doesn't have food and he doesn't have a job. So he does what the industrious young man would do. Amazing how you can go from foolish young man to industrious young man when your stomach is empty. He finds somebody who will hire him. He finds somebody who, who will give him a job. It's not the job he wanted. It's not the job anybody would want, but he gets a job taking care of pigs, farming pigs. And every one of the Pharisees and the scribes would go, oh my goodness, how low can you go? But they would also kind of go, serves him right. You know, aren't you feeling a little bit that way for him? Serves you right, buddy blow your father's money, take it away before he's dead, yeah, it serves you right. You go ahead and hang out with those pigs. See if it straightens you out. He ends up in the pig, with the pigs, feeding the pigs. Now, we always use an American term here. We say we ends up in the pig pen. They didn't feed pigs in a pig pen like, they, like we do here. They didn't throw slop out to the pigs. They fed them carob. You read your Bible. Some of your translations will actually say carob. I'll just leave that right there. 
for you all to consider next time you're making brownies and want to fake it. And he's so hungry, so hungry, he's considering eating care of. And he comes to himself. <laughs> Man, there's so much in that I want to talk about. But I'm moving on. So he comes to his senses and he says, I, I, I should go home. Even the servants in my father's house, even those who are hired and don't even live there, they, they come from the village to the father's house. Even those guys have food. I'm going home. I'll tell my father I don't deserve to be your son. I don't even deserve to live in your house. Just, let, just hire me on as a, as a day laborer. Hire me on so that I can have something. I'll take care of myself. I'm sorry. I offended you, and I deserve everything I've gotten. Ever feel that way toward God? Like you don't deserve the grace of God? Like you've done something that surprised God so much that he covered his mouth walked into the other room and said, did you see that? Do you know that can't happen to God? Because God knows the end from the beginning. So no day of stupidity in my life has God not already seen. And he saw my worst day when he let me come home in the first place. He's seen your worst day. I'm hoping it's already passed. But he's seen your worst day. And it didn't scare him away from the relationship with you. That's awesome. That's amazing. Because most of us, if we saw each other's worst day, would probably set up really good boundaries for everybody around us. Look at those people in your row. Probably some people there you don't want to associate with. Look at Byron over there. <laughs> Kim, have you, do you really know about the worst day? Maybe you should ask him this afternoon. Maybe you shouldn't ask him this afternoon. <laughs> so he returned home to his father. And while he was still a long way off, while he was still a long way off, his father saw him. Get that first. His father saw him. Your father sees you. Your father knows you. He understands what's happening in your life. He understands the decision-making and what motivated the decision-making. He understands your personality. He understands where you were born and how your parents raised you. He understands everything about you. He sees you and knows you deeply. His father saw him while he was still a long way off, coming, filled with love and compassion. He ran! The Pharisees again. That's embarrassing. Old men don't run. Especially old men with skirts on, and that's what he had. I love the image, and I've shared it with you before, hiking up his skirt, bony old man legs with knobby old man knees. He trucks out across the yard. Servants apparently start following him, probably because they're afraid he's going to fall. They start running after him. We know because they're there later. When he gets to the sun, that's that grace point that I was telling you about. When he arrives at the place where the sun is. And I'm sure the sun sees him coming and thinks, uh-oh, here he comes. Ever walk in the door? Remember when you first started going back to church or started going at all, and you walked in kind of with an uh-oh feeling in your mind, in your heart? I don't know. I don't know if these people knew. I don't know. I can remember walking into the Baptist church with my friend when I'd been uh, away from religion and God for a while and I was I was still a kid I was still a high school kid but I remember walking into the back that Southern Baptist Church with him thinking oh man this is uncomfortable this is not a place where I belong I was with my friend but it still felt really uncomfortable this is one of those moments in my life when I realized now that I was his evangelistic target he was taking me to see those evangelism movies that they used to release back in the 70s. I didn't realize what was going on until afterwards, and when I started making other people evangelistic targets, then I knew what that was. 
He was inviting me to church. It was, I, I, he was evangelizing me, and thank God for him. He comes running back. He, sees his, he, his, he, see, he comes running towards him. His father is moving his way, and I don't know, maybe he's thinking, oh, be careful, Dad, you're going to fall. Or maybe he's just worried about the collision that's coming. What is he going to say to me when he gets here? What pain's ahead of me? What's it going to cost me? Instead, when his father arrives, it's this collision between the ultimate need of his son and the ultimate love of the father. A collision between the ultimate need of mankind and the ultimate collision, the ultimate gift, the ultimate love of the father. Boom. And the love of the Father overwhelms him. He wraps his arms around him, embracing him and kissing him. He's been working with pigs. Have you ever been near a pig farm? Those little creatures stink really bad. He runs up to his Pig stink son throws his arms around me. He doesn't care about getting pig stink on him. Wrapping his arms around him, he begins to kiss him, dust and mud and maybe a few tear stains on his cheeks. His son begins the speech. Father, I have sinned. He's been practicing this for hours now against both heaven and you and I'm no longer worthy of being called your son. The father ignores him. Ignores him completely. His father said to the servants, I told you that they were following, quick, bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him. He doesn't say, go to the garage, find the storage box, you know, the big one with the little metal thing across the top, open it up, you'll see a red one in there, it's kind of moth-eaten and old, but bring that one. He says, go and find the best you can find. You know, who's, you know who owns the best robe in the house? Dad. So whose robe gets wrapped around the filth and unrighteousness of the son? Dad's. That robe would not only have the father's finest covering and color, it would have the father's cologne. They wore perfumes because they, they lived in a time without a lot of bathing other than ritual. And so when you would wrap the sun in that cologne-filled, beautiful robe, the filth and the smell would be engulfed, and he would smell like his father. And as he walked back to the house, anyone looking from afar would say, man, that, that guy looks like his father. Is that Jim or is that John? John? Can't tell from here. They look so much alike. And then the big deal. He gives him the ring. He slides the signet ring on this son's hand. It's not a, it's, it's, it's not a thing we understand. The only thing I could say for, your, for us would be he takes his gold card from his wallet and he hands it to him. And he says in that gesture, whatever debt you might have incurred while you were gone, I got it. And whatever debt you might incur between now and the end of your life, I got it. The Pharisees by now would be going nuts. He tells the servants, go back to the house. You know that fatted calf? 
That's a calf that's been set aside in a special pen. They're feeding it on grain to sort of fatten it up, get rid of some of the, the tastes, the wildness that's in an animal that's roaming out there eating acorns and whatever else. They, that calf we've got, we've been setting it aside for a special occasion. Go get that calf and start a party at the house. My son's come home. Jesus has repeated three times. This is the third. When one who is lost is found, there's a party in heaven. And the party instigator is the Father. Do you catch this? This story is an, is an introduction from Jesus to the Father. Jesus is trying to tell all of us who our Father is. We love Jesus. We're a little scared of the Father. Jesus is saying, no, this is the Father. This is what he's like. This is who he is. This is how this works. He's the instigator of the party. He's the one who's running out on the road. He's as much as part of this as any. He is the instigator behind all that you're seeing here. The words I speak are his words. I'm going to leave you the Holy Spirit of the Father when I leave. He's going to indwell you. He's going to actually be inside you. It'll be crazy. It'll be awesome. And they go back to the house, and the father starts the party, and the older son is outside. He's out in the fields. He's been working all day. He also is covered with sweat and grime from working out in the field. He comes home. He hears music and dancing. He hears the sounds of a party, and he stops, calls one of the servants over, and he goes, what's going on? Who's throwing a party in the house? No one asked me about this. No one told me about this. What's going on? The servant says, Oh man, you've got, you, got it. you can't believe it. Your father has killed the fattened calf because your brother has come home. My brother, my no account worthless brother, my brother who took a third of our father's income and has now gone off and wasted it. And this is where we get the concept that the son has been out with illicit pleasures. Nowhere do we know that except in this son's imagination. So where has he been? Has he been home? Or has he been imagining himself out on the road with his brother? Has he been imagining himself out there involving himself in some illicit pleasure? The older brother was angry and wouldn't go in. You see, Jesus has two groups. He's got these groups of, of notorious sinners who keep coming to hear and are joyously accepting what God is offering. And he's got these Pharisees and these, these scribes and Sadducees who are standing back with their arms crossed and a scowl on their face about what he's saying. I don't know about this guy. I don't know about him. I, I, I'm pretty sure I don't trust him. I'm pretty sure I can't believe him. And they're just kind of, they're looking askance at him and just shaking their head. And now Jesus is talking directly at him. And in my imagination, he looks him in the eye and he says, the older brother gets angry. And he stays out there on the driveway, refuses to come in. And the father, the father came out to the driveway and he begged him to come in. First century fathers don't beg. Shoot, 21st century fathers have a hard time with this. He went out on the driveway. He begged him to come in. We would be embarrassed. We would be embarrassed to be this father. Most of us do not have this kind of compassion. Most of us are not sold out to the love of our children this much to be so self-sacrificing, to find ourselves out there afar off with the servants and the neighbors all watching as we embrace this wandering profligate son, and to now have people hear us begging this cranky older son to come home, come in. 
Join the party. It'll be great. You see, the collision requires two parts. God's grace is always there. But we have to meet it. We have to accept it. We have to, to allow for the collision. Some of us have been dodging this for years. Some of us have been ducking God every time. He comes to us with his grace and we bob and we weave and we duck and we try to stay out. We look like Muhammad Ali. And the grace is there on this, on this driveway. This father is ready to wrap his arms around this son. Plant kisses on his cheek and walk him home too. And he's left it to the sun. And the story closes right there. Right there. And the father is left still out on the road. And he's still out on the road. 2,000 years after the telling of this story, the father's still on the road. You know what the church is? The church is a bunch of people crazy enough to join them on the road. To offer the best coverings that they have. The blood of Jesus and the robe of righteousness. To offer to walk with in fellowship all the way home. That's what the church in 2019 is. It's a bunch of crazy people out on the road looking for a wreck, looking for an opportunity to collide so that they can tell someone about the grace of God the sacrifice of Jesus and the wonder of the resurrection. If that's not a good reason and a, a good purpose for the rest of my life and yours, I don't know one. So as we start the new year, I just wanted to remind you where the cornerstone of Grace Point is. That's it. The door is open. The light is on. And the Father wants you home. Let's pray. This is an amazing picture, Lord. That slips away from us. Honestly, as I read through the Old Testament, as we read through the Old Testament, we, we keep being confronted with what we don't understand. Help us to understand and read through the lens of Jesus. Help us to recognize that he is in fact the exact representation of God in human flesh. And that their hearts beat as one. That the sacrifice on the cross was not independent of the heart of the Father. Help us to embrace the fact that we are loved by you. And that you want nothing more and to see all your kids come home. We commit ourselves as a church, as a group of people, many of whom have run into you and been covered by your blood, been embraced, wrapped in the robe of righteousness, and now hold your hand walking on toward home. We commit ourselves 
to joining hands with anybody we find on the road. Give us the courage to speak of the blessings of following you. To be a light in a place that's getting darker and darker every day. To live each day for the kingdom and your purposes. In Jesus' name.